you're thinking incorrectly, uh, God, you're never going to get any traction. And that's what I felt like when I read his book. We ran the numbers and we kill like double on the highway that we kill in hunting season. And that was a real eye opener for me. Like, wow, between the spot and the stock is where a lot of us fall apart. And I still experience this sometimes as, as those big bucks go in the cover. And now what do I do? That's what charged me up, man. Is I, I wanted to write, you know, I want all those books I just told you about, dude. That's what lit me up. This is Robbie Denning. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I would rest at peace for eternity if my legacy was that I made a positive influence on the non-hunting public about what hunters are and what hunting is. I finally got my buck on our last real day of hunting. So a pro-hunting organization is voting against hunting. And that says anti-hunting to me. There was a year straight where I was averaging up to 200 death threats a day. And I hugged it. Like, I just wanted to hug a bear. It's proven that the average steak in a grocery store touches 50 to 100 hands and machines. And we're putting that into our body. Hey, y'all, Cable Smith, host of the Lone Star Outdoors show here. This is Adam Weatherby. And I'm Corey Jacobson with Elk 101. This is Christy Titus. Hey, folks, this is John Bear. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative, brought to you as part of the Waypoint Podcast Network. All right, y'all, on today's podcast, I am excited to have Robbie Denning. Uh, For those of y'all that don't know him, what's wrong with you, for one? But (laughs) Robbie is master mule deer hunter. He is uh, co-founder of Rock Slide. And uh, Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, you have a book out and now as well right? I do. Yes. Um, uh, thanks for the intro. Yeah. I, I released hunting big mule deer back in 2015 and I actually have the follow-up, uh, hunting big mule deer, the stories coming out. Uh, what are we late May? So in about a month it should be mid to late June. Okay. That's right. I, I wasn't sure if the hunting big mule deer book was the one that was coming out or had already come out. So that's, that's good to know. Um, I definitely need to pick up a copy. I've heard, I've heard good things, uh, about the first book. Can't wait to check out the second one. Oh yeah. I should have sent you one before we did the podcast. Just remind me when we get done, I'll, I'll fire you a copy up there. Oh, fantastic. I, uh, I definitely, I probably spend too much time reading and not enough time hunting. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a studier and I've come to realize that about myself and I will, I'll read all the articles. I will, you know, highlight all the books. I'll, I'll go over the maps. I will, I will have the perfect plan. And half of the time I just never end up implementing it because I don't get enough time in the woods. Yeah, no reading is where it's at. I still think, you know, even in our digital age where, you know, we don't read more than a sentence or two before we move on. Uh, Charlie tremendous Jones, the motivational speaker of yesteryear always said that five years from now, you're going to be the same person you are now, except for the people that you meet and the books that you read. And man, he is right. If you want to change the direction of your life, do something different, master a skill, whatever it is. Um, I still think sitting down with a good book uninterrupted is a way to do it. You know, I run rock slide, so I'm, I'm reading digital stuff all the time, but the problem with, di- with digital is the platform that you're on is so distracting. You know, it's hard to really get deep into something. Um, you know, it's just not what digital's made to do. And, um, e- even a Kindle, you know, my book's been released on Kindle, but oh, man, I never read it on Kindle. That would, that would be hard for me because I'd want to, I'd want to jump around, but, um, the, uh, you know, just getting into a book and getting quiet, getting where nobody's bugging me. And, you know, I can't read a, re- a really long time. I'm reading uh, Cam Haynes' uh, book right now, uh, Endure. That's, that, I highly recommend that for people. I'm only about a third of the way through it. But I made it a third of the way through it the first time I sat down with it because it was so <laughs> engaging. But I can, only, I can only read about an hour and then I'm full. You know, I, 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 I need to just move away think about what I've read, you know, let, let it simmer in the subconscious, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's how I read the best, but yeah, yeah. I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a giant reader. I probably read three books a year, four books a year, something like that, you know, not nothing, nothing huge, but, but for me, it's, it really does give a guy an edge and it's, it's a great way to exercise your mind and give your mind a break in this digital world we live in. So you, you mentioned you're reading Cam, Cam's new book. Are yes. there are there any other books again aside from hunting big mule deer? 
um, that you would really recommend that are say in the outdoor or the the hunting space? Any like personal favorites that that? Oh yeah, recommend? dude! Oh, I, absolutely. Dwight shoes, um, uh, bow hunting, open country mule deer. That's a classic. Everybody needs to read that. Um, even if you're not a bow hunter, I still think there's good stuff in there about stalking and mule deer behavior and, you know, and, and he's just a fun read, you know, we, we lost him a couple of years ago. Um, he, he, he was a force for good in the world of bow hunting. Um, then, um, it's, it's a controversial book. Just, it's, well, the book's not the guy is Kurt <laughs> Garner. You know, he got, he got into a little bit of trouble. He didn't do everything right, but you know, he's a friend. I respect the guy. He's a good guy. He just, he just had a few troubles along the way, but it didn't, it didn't um, negate everything that was in his book. It's called how to find giant bucks. And it, it, it's a classic. It was written in 1983 and um, there's still so many good takeaways in that book. That's really the book that started the, the big mule deer revolution in my mind. Um, and so him, Dwight shoe, any of Walt Prothero's books, you know, mule deer quest, um, uh, oh, the other one, it's, it's, it's kind of a plain name, but it's like stalking trophy mule deer or something like that. But okay. Walt Prothero, he was a, he was a professor here at Weber state university in Northern Utah. And, um, uh, I think he just retired and very, very prolific mule deer writer for a long time. That guy was great because he wasn't just sitting on the knob with glassing. Like he, he, he got more into the close up stuff, tracking and still hunting and stuff like that. That's really where I kind of got to start on that and those styles of hunting, which are not as popular, but they're, you know, and especially on pressure mule deer and older mule deer, even if they're not pressured, you got to have those close range techniques down um because a lot of times that the bucks they're just going to be in the cover um so let's see we got those three guys um a guy um his his first name is Lindsay. i can't remember his last name right now um but he released a book uh two years ago it's on my blog in fact most of these books are on my blog um or at least mentioned but sometimes full book reviews but uh it's called it's it, it was the it was the life story of Dennis Winch his friend Dennis died just a couple of years ago as well and uh Dennis uh lived in southern Utah and um was a very prolific big buck hunter and and a guide too you know the guides are are who get the most experience you know there's 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 guys that hunt and then there's guys that hunt and guide. I like to listen to the guys that hunt and guide because they just have so much more experience. They're not just hunting their one or two tags a year. You know, they might be hunting, you know, 10, 10 tags a year. And so Lindsay uh, put that together. Um, uh, D- Dennis Winch, W-I-N-T-C-H. It's on Amazon. It's a very nice book. I'm, I'm really surprised it's not getting more traction than it is. You know, it's a, it's a hardcover, big book, color I mean, they did a good job, you know, it's 50 bucks, but you know, look at the crap we spend 50 bucks on to make us better hunters and it doesn't even work. You know, where this, this is something that would, 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 would really expand your horizons, um, on, on hunting big deer. Um, and and how do you spell, uh, Dennis Lynch? Winch W O I N T C H. I believe I'm probably 95% sure on that, but you can't miss it, dude. Amazon rules the world. I hate to say it, but they do just get on Amazon. That's where my book is. And just, just start typing this stuff in their search, in their search bar and it'll come up. They, they, they've collected almost all of these books. And even if they don't, if the book is out of print, like, um, I think Dwight shoes is out of print mm-hmm. and it's, uh, they, they still, they, excuse me, they still have used copies on there. You can find them on there. Um, another and one that came, uh, looks ahead. like it's Lindsay Parker. Is that, that Lindsay Parker? There you go. Lindsay Parker. Yeah. Yep. And it's yep. a, that, 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 Dennis Winch mule deer hunting legend, 50 years of hunting mule deer. There you go, bro. That's a good read. That really is a good solid read. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of little kind of short stories about Dennis's hunts that you can take out of, but, you know, he wrote for Christensen's arms, uh, magazine for a while that, uh, I, can't remember what, I think it was called Christians Outdoors. Um, he wrote, he had a column in there. And so a lot of his column stuff is in there. And he was kind of more of a conversational writer, more like you and I are doing right now, just talking in his, in his writing. And so it's not real tight writing. Mm-hmm. but it's good yeah like it's 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 flow of consciousness and I, it's good stuff i feel like that pulls you in though when you when you have that kind of more casual style of writing it pulls you in in its own unique way as long as it's a topic you're interested in 
Yep, yep, and that's how Dennis was, and 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 Dennis had had a very unique trophy, and I, I don't want to I don't want to botch it here, but because I don't have the numbers on it, but he he killed a buck in the late eighties, and it was down in southern Utah, and it's one of the few bucks that makes Boone and Crockett typical and non typical. And so what that takes for a buck to do that is to have a gigantic typical frame because to get into non-typical, you have to be, you have to net over 230. Well, non-typical means a whole bunch of deductions. And so that's what usually knocks them out of the typical category where Dennis is made both. I mean, I think it's net scores up in the high one nineties and it's uh, gross score was over 240. I mean, it's a really, really unique buck and uh it had a name i can't even remember what it was you know bigfoot or slewfoot or something like that it's it's a cool story that's in the book too just just probably one of the top 10 mule deer ever taken ever you know all times you know just because of its uniqueness and just just a giant um so anyways there's that book do you want me to keep going Hey, I will not turn down any more book suggestions. Okay, so let's see. And 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 if you're if you're in front of a computer right now, you can help me on some of these. So, so I believe Walt Prothero, P R O T H E R O, Prothero. He's going to have a couple in there. Mule Deer Quest, um, stalking trophy mule deer, something like that. Mule Deer Strategies, then, stalking mule deer, trophy mule deer. Yeah, any of that stuff is really good too. And because he was a columnist for Sports of Field, some of the stuff is just just short little chapters, kind of like kind of like my blog, just tips and tactics, which is great stuff to read. You know, it's not it's not deep. You know, you can just jump in, you can read something in five minutes, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, he he was really good at that style of writing, and and he's a good writer. You know, he's he's a professor, so you know, good tight writing, mm-hmm. uh, not a lot of wasted words. Um, an, another book that it came out last year and I, I did a full review on it on my blog um, is it's called, and you're, it, it's on, it's on Amazon. In fact, I think he only released it on Amazon. It's Dan Brannigan and it's called, so you want to hunt the West for mule deer. Now what? Um, and the, 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 that book is unique in the sense of Dan is from Michigan and that's where he grew up, cut his teeth on whitetail came from that whole culture and then moved um, out here. He's actually doesn't live too far from me, but I don't know him personally. It was just a coincidence that I picked up his book and he happened to live around here. Okay. Um, and, and he detailed his transition going from a whitetail hunter to a mule deer hunter. And it was so refreshing to read. It filled in a lot of gaps for me because you know, I'm on rock slides you know, we have three or 4 million unique visitors a year come to our site. A lot of them asking questions about mule deer guys from the East that want to come out here. And, and sometimes I don't, I don't connect with their questions very well. You know, it's, it's, they're very basic. They're very like, wow, you didn't know that. But once I read Dan's book, I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, when you're coming from that world, that's how you're thinking. And it would be no different than if I went to Michigan and decided I was going to, you know, pursue big whitetails, not just fill in the freezer, but big whitetails. Oh man, I'd be asking all kinds of silly questions too. But, but his book kind of answers that stuff. And so that is a really good book for people that are like, Hey, I, I want to go out West and hunt mule deer, but you know, I've spent my life hunting whitetails. You know, he, he can cover that. And, and, and I think, you know, with, 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 with hunting big bucks, you know, how you think is how you hunt. And if you're thinking incorrectly, if you're, if you're, you know, believe in old wives, t- wives tales or myths or, you know, just some of the stuff that floats around, that's just kind of BS, uh, God, you're never going to get any traction. And that's what I felt like when I read his book, like, oh, okay. And he clarifies some of the stuff. And let, let me make a, a give an example is, and I never really thought about this, but mule deer are typical mule deer country. Most of our mule deer migrate. You know, there's exceptions, but most of them migrate between a summer and a winter range. And so Dan made the point in his book that depending on when you're hunting and just one month or even a week can make a difference. There is large tracts of country that um, has mule, good mule deer habitat, feed everything that they need. And there's no mule deer there. <laughs> and, 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 and yet you can move a mile or even shorter in some cases, or, you know, or longer, obviously, if it's a big migration and, and here they all are. 
And so they're not evenly dis- as evenly distributed throughout their habitat as whitetail are. Whitetail, now there's exceptions, maybe up where you live, there's, you know, they're probably having to migrate too, especially if they're mountain whitetail, but on the, especially in the East, they're more evenly distributed. You know, and, and so it, it makes, it takes part of the challenge of finding them a way in that, yeah, if I just go to whitetail country, there's going to be so many whitetail per square mile where you can go to mule deer country and there could be zero. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so he, he kind of, um, and that's just one example of, you know, dozens in the book of kind of how he had to think and change his thinking and, and it made him successful. I mean, he has done pretty, pretty dang good on mature to big bucks. Um, for, for a guy that moved out here from Michigan, he really <laughs> has, he hunts like a local, he knows what he's doing. Um, he, uh, he's a big family guy, takes a lot of people hunting. I think last year, gosh, they took two or three really nice bucks uh, that he helped people on. And so that, that's, I'm kind of going on and on about that. But that's a really good book. Um, two, two books, uh, that you should read, uh, David Long's, um, he released, public land mule deer, the bottom line in 2006. So it's been out a while. That was a really good book for the DIY kind of backpack, maybe more backpack style hunter. Um, you know, David was, you know, uh, just, I mean, he, the dude runs marathons. I mean, he's, he's a very physical dude and, you know, he, he's doesn't use horses very much, you know, stuff like that. It's all on his back. And that book was written from that perspective. And da- David is, you know, he's, He's probably in the top five, 10 big buck hunters in the West, you know, as far as this, the size of bucks that he's taken per day that he's hunted, you know, and the number of them. And he just lays it out. And David is a very practical writer. And David is very, oh, I, don't, I don't want to use the word scientific, but, you know, he writes from a technical angle. Mm-hmm. You know, we're a writer like me. I'm more conversational stories, you know, stuff like that. David, you know, tables and, you know, did top five things to do this way and, you know, how to hunt this specific habitat. You know, he's really good at that kind of stuff. So, so that's, that's a book right there that I think everybody should read. And then in 2000, I think it was 17, he released, uh, the, the, what's called the edge. It's just the edge. (laughs) And, um, and, 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 and he co-wrote it with Mike Duplan, who is a columnist for, uh, Western Hunter magazine. And, um, two, that's his friend and two, you know, very knowledgeable mule deer hunters. They hunt slightly, you know, differently from each other. So it, it gave two different perspective, but that's kind of a modern version of David's first book. And David, when his first book was only rifle hunting. And by the time he got to his second book, he had picked up archery and done very well at it. You know, per day hunted, the dude did very well at archery hunting you know, big mule deer. And so I think he lays out the best advice for guys wanting to archery hunt big mule deer um you know he's got chapters in there on the subject and scenarios and tips and tactics and antidotes and you know all that kind of stuff where where even my book i've been a a big buck hunter with a bow for 20 years but you know i'm still it's just one of the weapons i hunt with so you know i don't have a lot of depth in my book about archery hunting mule deer, you know, I've only really only taken three big bucks with my bow and, you know, almost 20 years. It's not, you know, I go six or seven years, not even getting one. So I'm not the go-to guy on that kind of stuff, but David is, he's really, really good. I, in fact, when people ask me about, yeah, I want to archery hunt big bucks, it's, it's the only him and Dwight shoes book, but Dwight shoes book was written in the eighties. So it doesn't have all the modern equipment and optics and everything in it. Th- those are the only two books I'm really pushing people towards right now on, um, archery hunting, big mule deer. Um, another one, and it's not just on mule deer, but, uh, Chuck Adams, um, the, the books he, he wrote two books and how oh, I don't have the names of them right now. He probably wrote more than that, but he's, he's got good mule deer content within his books. And, you know, he took some great bucks with his bow. He's a, he's a really good one to follow as Let's well. See, we got Go ahead. The complete book of bow hunting. And Super Slam Adventures with North American Big Game, or what I'm seeing on on Amazon right now. The, those those two, and is and and again, they're not just mule deer because he hunted everything, but they're, they're good reads. He was a good writer. Uh, you can kind of follow his life journey on how he pulled off that Super Slam, which was not really funded by big money. It was funded <laughs> by himself. A lot of people assume that, but you know, he he pulled that off pretty much 
on his own. And, um, and he's got some good mule deer stuff in there. It's, you know, it's short. You're going to learn a lot more than about mule deer in there, but he was just a great bow hunter, one of the greatest. And, um, I, I felt I, I did full book reviews on, on those two books on my blog. You know, it's been a few years back, but I just thought, you know, these are, these are, these are needed reading for, for guys that want to up their game. Um, you know, one of the bow hunting greats, uh, let's see. This is, I mean, this is a fantastic list. I, I think you may have just screwed up my budget for the, Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the rest of this month. Um, I just, I, I can't, I can't help myself when it comes to books. That's the one thing I struggle to ever talk myself out of is, is picking up new books. You know, there was something, uh, you were talking a little bit about when we were talking about Dan Brannigan, kind of in his book, talking about those differences between whitetail and the mule deer and how the mule deer aren't as, as evenly, evenly populated throughout the habitat. Um, is that, is that more of a behavior thing or would you say that's more of a, a population thing? There's just not, I mean, whitetail or you can't drive down the road in some States without swerving around three of them versus muleys, the populations you're not seeing as much as that. It's, uh, I think it's going to be both and it's going to depend on where you're at. Um, there's obviously more whitetail habitat in the United States. There are more adaptable deer. They can live, um, a few live in the mountains, um, you know, mountains by my definition, big mountains, there's a few, um, but you know, they inhabit the, the lower country and there's just a lot more of that. So I think, I think it's, it's both, it's going to be from a population standpoint, you know, and mule deer, you know, there's less of them millions of white tails, you know, maybe if a million mule deer, you know, something like that. I don't know how my number is exact, but so that that's going to be some of it right there, but it, it's, it, they're migratory. So, you know, you can go up on the Kaibab and we're starting now in, in Northern Arizona and between now and the end of June, you know, there'd be thousands of mule deer moving up into that country. You go back there the middle of December after a couple of big snowstorms, there's zero. And they've, they've moved anywhere from five miles to 50 miles. I mean, it's, you know, and whitetails just aren't doing that. So I think it's, it's going to be depend on, on where they're at. And then also, you know, the, the densities as well. Okay. So, yeah, I was, I was just kind of curious if it was like specifically a behavioral thing where they tend to clump up more, or if it's just, if it has to do, it sounds like it's a little bit of both with the, how migratory they are, but mm-hmm. it's just also, we're not seeing as many mule deer as, as we are whitetail. Mm-hmm. What do you, I mean, that said, what do you see as the future of mule deer? I mean, both mule deer and, and whitetail have been in trouble in the past. And because of the adaptability of whitetail, you know, I mean, again, we're, they're practically a nuisance animal in a lot of States versus mule deer we're not seeing the numbers what kind of future do you think mule deer have in the u.s future's bright but it's up to us and every place mule deer have been managed they 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 do well so um you know i've got a long history with mule deer i can i can think back over the decades on 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 population rises and falls and you know buck to doe ratios up and down and 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 I can tell you this, if we take care of them, they do pretty dang good. And, and I'd give the best example, the most recent example of uh, Colorado. And when in, in 1999, they moved from a general over-the-counter, unlimited, uh, basically unlimited tag structure for mule deer to a limited license structure where you had to draw and they could uh, manage each mule deer herd individually instead of the old system, which was really just statewide I mean, all the seasons were the same, buy a tag, go anywhere. You know, it was that style of hunting. And once they moved to that, it only took like three or four years and the deer were coming out our ears, big bucks, populations were doing well. I mean, they just were killing it. And, um, you know, then they, they, you know, mule deer are always subject to hard winters, you know, just by where they live and the whole migratory thing I was talking about. They, um, they, they, they experienced a decline in the mid 2000s after that management had come in, but they rebounded and they did well. They've had a good run for, for another 13, 14 years. Now they've started to change this again. And they're saying it's because of CWD and that big bucks, old bucks spread it more. Yeah, I'm waiting, still waiting for more research 
I'm not arguing with the research that's been done, but you know, when there's not a whole lot and it's fairly new, I, it's always subject to change, but they're, they're trying to manage for a, a younger age class of buck right now. So they're putting more pressure on them. That probably won't hurt the overall population, but it will lower the buck to doe ratio. And, and, um, and so my whole point in telling you all that is they're very responsive to it. And, um, uh, there's, there's exciting things happening in like Wyoming right now is they're building these, they're funding these underpasses on these migration corridors and deer typically migrate in, in, in certain places. Just think of bottlenecks. Now, you know, they may be wandering off a mountain range that's 30 miles long and, um, and heading for, you know, winter range, it's 80 miles away. Um, and, and, and it starts as a very broad, broad mouth on a funnel, but they hit these bottlenecks, which could just be passes. It can just be, um, inha- uh, inhabited valleys, you know, where, where humans live and they may only use, I and mean, they may, may cross in an area that's as little as a quarter mile wide that like, that's, that's their funnel for whatever reason. And Wyoming, is uh, protecting those now through easements, land purchases, and where they cross highways, which are detrimental to mule deer. And, and, you know, we we might drive down the highway and, you know, you you see a deer every mile and you don't, well, that's not very much, but man, you don't see all the deer that are laying off in the brush. You know, the, the studies that have been done is, you know, I can't even remember if it's a majority or it's significant amount. They don't die within sight of the road. Um, it probably is a majority. If you really, if you think about it, um, you're only seeing the ones that are killed instantly. And so you do that for four or five or six months, you know, that's a lot of dead deer that you just don't really think about. And there, <laughs> there's one unit around here. I remember everybody was bitching and moaning about, Oh, no big bucks, blah, 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 close the season, do all this other stuff. And this good old biologist was like, well, we can close all the season, but we've ran the numbers and we kill like double on the highway that we kill in hunting season. And that was a real eye opener for me. Like, wow, you know, I just really didn't even think about it that way. That's a lot of deer. And so Wyoming is, is building these underpasses where these bottlenecks are, you know, and these things cost millions of dollars. They, yeah, they really yeah. do, but, but it, it's still, it's what it's, you know, it's a species we need to take care of. You know, I mean, we spend millions of dollars on saving a salamander, you know, why can't we do it on, on mule deer? And we are, these states are, 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 are studying these migrations and I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting Wyoming right now because I think they're kind of at the forefront of it. You know, they've got a lot of, I, I don't remember what their project is called, Wild in it, it uh, the Wyoming Initiative or something like that, but um, where they're studying these migration routes extensively, you know, radio collared, uh, GPS transmitting collars. So they know, you know, they know the name of that doe. They know where she summered, where she had her fawn, where her transitional range is. And, and, and now they've got all these data sets on, on these deer and, and, and they've got bucks collared too. And they're figuring this out on where we need to protect these, these deer. And, you know, it's okay to build a subdivision here, but man, don't build it right here. You know, stuff like that. So I think to answer your question, that's a long, long answer. If we take care of them, they're going to take care of us. I'm not a doom and gloomer. I can't be. If I'm a doom and gloomer, mule deer are their better days are gone. They're you know they're 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 going to die out. They're going to go extinct, dude. I'm selling my rifles. I'm selling my horses. I'm done because I ain't going to be able to even get my mind into it once I get in the woods, you know. And I'm just talking about Robbie Denning. Maybe other guys are different, but I go. I see guys talk to guys. I don't hunt with guys like this because I purposely stay away from them. They are so down in the mouth about mule deer, and it was better when Grandpa was around. And blah 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 blah. Well, you know what? None of us can have a time machine to go into the past. We got to deal with what we got now. And the best thing we can do is join the Mule Deer Foundation, get involved in these local chapters, uh, you buy hunting licenses. That's conservation. And um, you know, I, I burn licenses every year that I that I buy. That I you know maybe I don't even get to hunt them, but it's like okay, well at least that money went to the state. And 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 I know and I, our, our fishing game organizations are not perfect, but they're the only ones really taking care of these deer. So I'm, I'm happy supporting them is what I'm getting at. You know, go to meetings, you know, get involved, do all that other stuff, but you know, don't be the guy that just, Oh, I drew my tag and I went out and I hunted three days. This, this sucks. And you know, man, just don't even go, go hunt something else that there's a lot more of, you know, they I honestly, even when mule deer populations are doing well, big bucks are hard to get, you know, they really are. And so, so I, I think the future is what we're going to make it for mule deer. I really do. Um, 
maybe I've got rose colored glasses, but that's okay. That keeps me hunting. And, you know, I spend thousands of dollars on mule deer a year. And, and, and that's why, because, you know, I love them and, 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 and I want to, I want to hand it down to the next generation. And, um, and, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people to care. Well, I mean, I, I think it ties back to, um, kind of what you said earlier what was what was the line you used it was how you think is how you hunt mm-hmm. um and you know it, it, to me that kind of like with what you were saying here yeah if if your mindset is that you're never going to find a big mule deer and it's just the hunting sucks and you know oh it's fishing games fault oh it's out of state hunters fault oh it's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh it's everyone's fault but myself but my own you know because Mm -hmm. i'm perfect Uh, of course you're not going to start seeing big mule deer of course you're not going to get anything like i'm surprised you even get out of your truck at that point like really (laughs) yep that's what i mean you're we're talking the same game i think it applies to fishing sports whatever you know how you think is is, is how you're going to perform. And, and, and so if I do have rose colored glasses, that's, that's fine by me. It keeps me rolling. And don't get me wrong. Like I'm not by far, I, I, I try not to be, but so often when I'm in the woods, I'm trudging around all doom and gloom, like screwing everything up and I'm never going to see anything. And, Mm -hmm. but then I have to catch myself and, um, and, and sometimes maybe just take a day back at the, back at the campsite <laughs> and right start over right. the next day oh yeah i do that too man so i mean some we sometimes we just you know hunting's hard hunting wears on you you know and and um, hunting is always harder than what we make it in our minds and and so there's always a disconnect when we when we get somewhere that's like um you know the days wear on the grind kicks in and, 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 and this any species, not just mule deer. I mean, you know, that's I think the best hunters I know are, are all positive thinkers, put it that way. Cause they, 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 they can put their mind to the task long enough to be successful and they can hunt through the hard times and the, and the emotion of it all. And it's just far too easy to sit at your computer and apply for tags and look at Google earth and do all this other stuff. You get so flipping pumped up, man, I'm going to, I'm going to conquer the world. You get it out there after a day and a half and you ain't seeing what you're finding. It's, it's, it's mentally a challenge and that, and that catches a lot of people off guard. It's, it's a struggle. And that's probably, you know, arguably I would say that's probably the hardest part of hunting is the mental aspect. Yeah. Um, like without a doubt, without a doubt, I, I would say that the mental aspect, the mental challenge of it is what sends more guys home with empty tags than, than anything else. Mm -hmm. so you hunt mule deer and you pretty much don't hunt anything i mean is there do you go out for anything else or is it just i mean it's just mule deer just mule deer i take my son um uh, he wanted to go elk hunting so i've taken him out we've got some cow elk tags that are open east of where i live here and that's a pretty good hunt i've taken him out on it but i have not I don't think I've bought a tags elk tag since 04, 05. And it's not that I wouldn't, you know, it's just mule deer hunting for big mule deer, mature bucks, four years and older is it's hard. And, it, and, and you know, I didn't want to like make it sound like I'm some, you know, suffering servant out here. Poor, poor me. I'm just saying it's hard and it wears on you. And what I've learned, this is what I learned. I learned it when I got married and we started to have kids focus is my superpower. And if I am screwing around hunting bears and fishing for steelhead and hunting turkeys and elk and all these other things, those are number one. And a lot of guys, my younger crowd will, will understand this. It costs money. All right. And so, um, you know, that limits how much I can do at other times of the year. You know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm blowing all my funds on, on hunting all these other, these other species, cause you know, when I hunt, uh, when I hunt turkeys, I want to do it right. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a lot of time out there, a lot of gas, a lot of, a lot of travel, stuff like that. And, uh, same with bears. I used to hunt, I used to hunt bears a lot. Um, archery hunt, uh, bears have taken a, a one bear with my bow and one with my muzzle loader. Um, but again, it was just more time and more days. And so, um, then when it's time to hunt mule deer, well, I've, I've take I've spent part of my time and money budget and energy budget. This is a lot of things. Something I did not understand until I got older is you only got so much good energy to, to hunt. And what by good energy, I mean, 
focused hunting days where you're actually productive. All right. I'm not the kind of guy that thinks, yeah, just showing up is going to do it. No, you can show up in mule deer country for 50 years and never get a big buck. You know, you got it. You got to do it right. You got to work your techniques right. And you got to, you can, and, and something to remember about hunting big mule deer, you can be doing everything right and still not get one. That's just how it is. So you got, that takes a lot of time and energy. And, and, and for me, for my personality, it, it drains me. And so when I was trying to do all that other stuff, I just was not putting my best foot forward for mule deer. You know, by the time, man, if you call me mid November, dude, you'll hear it in my voice. I'm tired by then. You know, (laughs) I have been looking for big bucks since early July in some form or another, you know, one to six days a week, you know, you keep that up for three or four months. It, it wears on you. And so it is easy for me to say, you know what? I just saw a 330 bull down in that canyon and the season is actually open. I am so glad I don't have an elk tag because I would be <laughs> down there chasing that sucker. And I, cause I used to do that. I used to try to do all that stuff. And, 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 and I'm not saying this is the way you have to do it. This is just the way I do it. Cause dude, there's some very successful multi-weapon hunters out there. Tony Treach, he wrote a chapter for uh, my latest book that's coming out and he's a, a multi-weapon archery um, rifle. I, he probably would hunt with the muzzle loader if he had an opportunity. And, and I mean, hunts bulls, bucks. Um, I mean, he, he's really good at what he does and, 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 and he's just built that way. And, but, but I'm not, you know, focus. I said it when I started, that's my superpower. That's if the more I focus, the better I do, but the more I focus kind of the more I kind of got to let some of these other things that, that are, that are sort of distractions right now. Um, dude, I used to love to fish. Catching big river fish was, was my thing. And, and I, I kind of had to get out of it here for about the last 20 years. And, and, you know, fishing, like that's right now. Why would going fishing today impact my mule deer hunt in October? Well, let me tell you why, dude. I've got, I've got five horses. I'm taking care of, of, of 32 acres um, between growing hay and uh, pasture for the horses. They don't need all 32. We sell a lot of that hay. Um, but, but that's, that's all money that goes back into my hunting budget and, and take, and take a lot of guys get out of horses because they're a full-time job. Yep, exactly. So, so dude, if I'm off running the river today and I'm not out here fixing fence and irrigating and everything, I'm getting behind, I'm getting behind. And so by the time, you know, July rolls around when I really need to be out there doing this stuff, I am not where I need to be. And so that's kind of how I have to think a little bit. Now, my dad is getting older. He can't really get out and hunt at all. I'm almost at all, but he can fish. And so I am carving out days and happy to do it. I'm going to rent a drift boat this summer. and I'm going to take my dad down the river because that's what he used to do with me when I was, you know, 15 years old. And, you know, he, he, he made sure I got out there. I'm going to do that stuff. I really am. I don't want to make it sound like just, nope, nope, I'll never do that stuff. But it's not going to be for me. It's going to be for him. And then, and it's not that I didn't fish the last 20 years, but I did the kids fishing, you know, a lot, a lot of ponds, a lot of bobbers, you know, stuff like that. A lot of, you know, getting out on the water at 10 AM, which to me is like, we just missed the best four hours, you know, what are we doing out here? But, you know, so, so it's, I don't want to make it sound like it's just all mule deer, you know, mule deer or nothing. I, I'm not at all, but it's, where I, where I had to put my focus is, is, is really where, and that's where I'm at in my life right now. That doesn't mean things um, won't change. I would love to get back into river fishing and fishing big fish and everything, but you know, I'm still raising kids, dude. I got, in fact, I'm out on my back patio right now because if I'm in my house recording this, you're going to hear all my kids getting ready for school and, you know, fighting and who's in the bathroom, you know, I'm, and I'm, in, I'm in that stage of my life right now. And, you know, if, as things change and everything, I might be able to do a few more things like that. But, but as of right now, it's just, it's just better for me to focus on, on big bucks. So that's why definitely why you focus on hunting mule deer. So you can be as effective as possible while hunting them. But what is it about mule deer? So why, why focus on mule deer and not elk or not bear? Why that particular focus on big muley bucks? Dude, it's just what lit my fire. I did all that stuff. I'm, I've killed four elk with my bow, three bulls and one cow. I, like I said, I killed two bears. 
Um, uh, steelhead fishing was huge to me. I love that. I wouldn't say I was super good at it, but you know, spent a lot of time on it. Just loved that lifestyle. I mean, if um, I had to be super good at something to enjoy it, I wouldn't enjoy anything. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's just kind of that's what I mean for my personality. That's that's just me. You know, when when I was steelhead fishing, I was into it. You know, I was meeting the guys that were the best at it. I was I was doing everything I could to to get good at it. It's just it's just how I'm wired. I mean, I, 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 if you can't tell, dude, I'm I'm diagnosed. ADHD, you know, I, I, I talk fast, talk over myself, you know, I, my, my mind's running faster than my, than my body can. I mean, it's, it's just how I'm built. I've always been that way. And so, so for, but to answer your question, big, big mule deer out of all that stuff, all that stuff I just talked about, it, they were the most challenging and, and it could just be, you know, the, the difficulty of getting them, maybe there's not as many, I don't know. Elk are doing, elk are going crazy right now, dude. I'm seeing 320, 340 bulls every year on OTC tags. I mean, it's a great time to be an elk hunter. Um, and, and, and I, I, I got a little bored and it's not that I was shooting 330 bulls. I was not, but I just got a little <laughs> bored with that pursuit. I really did. And, 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 and mule deer, it just had to be the challenge that kept, that kept drawing me back. And the, and, and, and every time I would succeed at it, you know, I wanted to go another level. I wanted to do it again, do it again, do it again, you know? Um, and so I probably, I'm not getting it into words, but to me, it was just the most exciting of, of everything that I was doing. Um, and, and so that, that's why I went that direction. See, for me, it's always been elk, but I suspect that may also be because I haven't encountered a real like i've seen a few in the distance like good good sized mule deer but i haven't uh i just i I don't know i haven't had an encounter with like a really big muley buck and i think i i i question whether or not my passion for elk has to do with the fact that i've just seen more of them or or what it is so i am curious uh you know on that day that i finally kind of run into that big mule deer buck what how my focus is going to change because for me, it's always been like my season, it's elk season. And then if I get a white tail or a mule deer, awesome. Like, you know, if I see one, I'll, I'll go after it. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go out chasing muleys unless my elk tag is filled. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how in the, you know, upcoming years that that changes or if it does. And again, that's why I keep mentioning personality, because I think a lot of it's tied to our personality. How are we wired? How did God make us? Like, what are we made to do? What, what turns our crank? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I start, I started college as an electrical engineer and was doing okay with it. But I was looking around at these guys I was in college with and like, (sighs) lack of better term, these guys were nerds in a good way. Like (laughs) just, just detail smart, like, dude, we're staying up tonight. And we're studying for the calculus test. And you know, I mean, wait, I mean, they're, they're, they're as pumped up for that as, you know, I am for hunting big bucks. And I just felt like I'm just a big fake. I don't even fit in with these guys. You know, that was, was really my, at least 50% of my decision to, to go with an English major. Um, and, and so, yeah, dude, I'm that guy that just has an English degree, but dude, that, that's what charged me up, man. Is I, I wanted to write, you know, I want all those books I just told you about, dude, you know, there's more than what I told you about, you know, I was oh, yeah. reading all that stuff when I was 17, 18, 19, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And, and dude, that's, that's, that's what lit me up, you know? And, and, um, so, so I just kind of discovered then that, that that's how I'm built. That's how God made me. And so this is one of the things I need to pursue. And dude, I, I am much happier with an English degree than I ever would have been with, with an engineering degree. And, and, and by the grace of God, I've been able to kind of navigate it and do really well with it. And, um, you know, it's, but, but, but my whole point in all this dude is I just figured out that that's how I'm made. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm different than you and you're different than me. We're not better than each other. It's just, it's just how we are. And so, you know, when I get on a podcast, you know, I'm just, I always try to just point people out that this is just what I like to do. It doesn't mean you got to be like me to, to be successful. I, I, and that's why I mentioned Tony Treach. Jason Carter's another one. Very good, uh, big buck hunter, you know, probably killed the most 200 inch bucks of probably anybody walking right now, but dude, he hunts other things too. Um, it seems like he's more and more getting focused on mule deer, but you know, he's a great, 
great hunter of, of all species, you know, so, so we're all a little bit different. I want to make sure that, you know, if you're out there thinking, but man, I really do like cutting elk. Oh, that's all good, man. Just take some of the stuff that I've learned and, 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 and apply that. And, and I think you're, I think you're going to do better, you know, but when I was just kind of being the jack of all trades, master of none, it just wasn't very fulfilling to me. And, and I, I remember being on an elk hunt in 94, one of my last bow hunts for elk. And I, I just, it was the first week of September. I'm like, man, I, I need to be up on those big ridges. There's big bucks up there. I know where there's a big buck. And, you know, and I was trying to help my buddy get an elk and, and, you know, I, I was just dying. I remember I just hated it. I'm just like, man, I got an elk last year. I don't even really want to be here. And, and I remember him just begging me, dude, like, dude, please, man, let's just stay. I, I, I don't think I bagged him, but I think I was like, I don't want to stay any extra time. I want to go, I want to go buck hunting. It was some scenario like that. And I remember him just like, dude, come on, please. But dude, I, I, I it was the best decision I made. And the reason I remember that hunt is because that was my last time I ever picked up a bow and went for elk. And I just started putting that time towards mule deer. And, uh, and I, and honestly, I suck at big buck hunting for, with a bow. I've only killed three big bucks in you know, 17, 18 years, something like that. But, um, it, it was just more fulfilling to me. You know, it was, it was where I was supposed to be or when I was trying to divide my time between buck hunting and elk hunting, I it was just, I just didn't feel like I was giving either one of them a, a very good effort. So, you know, I, I, like I said, most of my focus has been on elk. My very first tag field was was a little muley buck. And you can actually, I'm not sure if you can see him. That's him right there behind me. There's a great big notification on my phone about meeting recorded, blah, 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 blah. And I can't get rid of it. So, dude, I can't see you oh. anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a he's a tiny little mule deer buck. Um, he was in velvet and little awesome. spike. Yeah, I got down in Arizona and... I love him to death. You know, he'll always kind of, he's, he's right here behind me on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, always have kind of that place of honor. Oh yeah. As my first buck. You bet, dude. That's great. I've got mine right here in the garage. In fact, I'm walking around the corner right now, dude. It's a, it's a two by three. Where is it? It's hanging here somewhere. It's a little dinky two by three, dude. And I'm like, you know what? Oh, here it is right here. I'm like this, this buck in a big way is the one that started it all. I, I, dude, I did not kill a mule deer from, 12 years old till I was 19 and I hunted every single year <laughs> in great mule deer hunt country with good mule deer hunters. And, and dude, part of it was, I was just a terrible shot. I was still not that great, but this buck, just like the one behind you on the wall, dude, it represents something, you mm -hmm. know? And so, so yeah, dude, it's, it, it, I, it's not just about big, big mule deer. I mean, that's where I'm at right now, but no, dude, I, I honor them all. I'm with you. I'm glad you got that buck hanging on the wall. No, yeah, I love him to death, but, you know, always trying to improve. You know, I've heard you say before that that these big muley bucks are almost like a, they can almost be classified as their own, like, subspecies compared to mm -hmm. the younger age class. What does that entail? Like, what are the differences you see as these, as these bucks get older and gain kind of more life experience, I guess? <laughs> um, because in hunted units, they they disappear. They just be once they get to velvet rub or even maybe even before that, they are, um, just not seen very often. And it starts making you think that they're not around. And, um, that's why scouting so important. So you can verify that they are so that when you quit seeing them, that, you know, that well, no, he's just right here and, and they have an affinity for cover and they become more like a black tail, um, on the, on the West coast, uh, where my, my Oregon and Washington hunting brothers live that, um, you know, they don't shoot anything over a hundred yards. A lot of shoot a lot of stuff, 20 yards. doesn't really matter if you're hunting with a bow or a rifle, you know, you got to get in close to them. They, they become more that way. And, and the reason I keep saying hunted units, because yeah, you can, you know, I get friends that are, <laughs> I, I killed a big buck out West here a couple of years ago with my muzzleloader. And, um, I shot him at like 70 yards in the cover. He lab aged at five years old, 27 inch buck. I was real, real happy with him. And I posted it somewhere and there was a guy that lived out there and he was just like one unit over. And I was just saying that, Hey man, these, these bucks are in the cover. You know, this is where I'm seeing them. Yeah. There's lots of mule deer in other places, but the big bucks were in the cover, even during the rut. He's like, no, they're all out here running around the sagebrush. I'm looking at them right now. 
And, and so I, I looked at the regs and I'm like, yeah, dude, your, your season has been closed for three weeks. And, uh, and he was like, oh yeah. I said, but, but seriously, that's the difference right there. Those bucks are smart. And, and when they're hunted, dude, they hide. They hide. I think they hide better than a whitetail, a bull, anything else. I really do. And, and, and yet it can be one or two days after the season and boom, here they are. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me how, how they are. And so, so what you said about, I, I, I think of them as a subspecies. I know there's probably a biologist out there rolling his eyes. They're not really <laughs> a subspecies, but, but they're different than the species itself. That's why I say that because they just we have those things. I said, they just become more secretive, harder to find. I mean, they are just, vampires that, you know, I don't want to say they're totally nocturnal. They, 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 they are crepuscular. They do come out in the, in the evenings and the mornings and stuff. And, and sometimes in the middle of the day, if you know where to look, but, but they're just a lot harder to find and they, they just change. And, 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 and as an extension to that, I'm not ever going to get into the whole thing that mule deer are smarter than white tails or anything like that. I'm not going to do that. But I, I, I do think younger white tails, are more savvy than younger mule deer. Uh, the younger mule deer, the, 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 the one to three-year-old mule deer, they're the ones that give mule deer a, a bad name. Dude. <laughs> they are, they are out in the open, you know, all hours of the day. They're, I hate to use the word dumb, but they, they just, they don't do well around rifles. You know, they just can't seem to hide. Well, I mean, I think we've all, we've all seen the, the young mule deer that you spook, it runs, you know, 50, a hundred yards and turns around. It's like, mm -hmm. huh, what was that? That's what and I'm talking like, about. <laughs> yeah. And so then sometimes I've heard people that haven't hunted old mule deer. They, 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 they characterize all mule deer as doing that. And it's like, no, not for the most part, you know, big bucks, they don't, they don't give you any second chances. Rarely, sometimes they don't even give you a first chance where, yeah, those little bucks, you, you don't see a white tail do that as often, right? They don't yeah. just run out there and stop at 50 yards and watch you or hundred yards or whatever, you know, once they're moving, they're moving. You know, we've got a few white tails around here. I would characterize myself as a white tail hunter, but, um, uh, you know, I've been around them. I've killed one with my bow and, um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're a little more savvy at those younger ages. It takes a mule deer kind of getting to four years old plus before they take on those characteristics. And so that's why I think of them as, as, as a different animal, because if you hunt them like the rest of the herd, you're, you're not going to see them. You, for the most part, you're just not going to see them. And that's where a lot of guys get down in the mouth about it. And I hear it every year. Like, There's just no big bucks. You know, all I saw was does and forkies and, and I'll figure out where the guy's hunting. I'm like, oh yeah, there's a big buck right there, dude. I saw him, you know, two years ago or whatever. I know somebody that's hunted there. I know bucks that have come out of there that, oh, they're there. They're there. You're just, you're just not, you're just not looking where they're at on, you know, your mule deer country is beautiful. They live in open country for the most part. And so it's really easy to just spend all your time looking in that country. And sometimes they're there, but the bigger bucks, you know, they're, they're, they can't be, or they wouldn't be alive. That's why I keep mentioning hunted units. You know, if they're, if they're, if it's a hunted unit with, you know, a significant amount of tags in it, which is most of the West, <laughs> They're not going to be out in that open country. They would be dead if they were. Do you think that's probably the biggest problem that guys have when it comes to hunting mule deer is that they have this expectation that they're going to behave kind of this certain way based on the younger age class. So they just, they never change their tactics. Mm -hmm. I do. I wrote a big article in my upcoming book. Um, it took, uh, uh, I've already forgot the name of it, Defining the Mule Deer Rut. And um, I did a seminar at Huntering Ex Hunt Expo in Salt Lake on it back in February, and I turned it into an article. And that's what that was about, is that you cannot base your hunting techniques on what you're seeing. You need to base it on what the calendar says and what big bucks are doing on these certain dates of the, on the calendar between October 20th and, and December 20th. You're, you're going to have better success doing that. And I mean, observation is 
key. I mean, that's the kind of the basis of our pursuit is observation, but you know, observation will lie to you because we can't see at night and we don't see what's going on at night with these big bucks and what they're up to. And until you start tracking them, and I guess you can use night vision now in some places, but you still can't look at very many big bucks that way. You'll see that, uh, um, that they are around much more than we think they are. But by the time that the, the sun peaks over the horizon and, and it, you're just, they're just going to be a lot harder to find. It doesn't matter if it's the rut or not. And so, yeah, we can't just hunt by observation. Um, I, I, I've made that mistake many, many times and, um, you you got to know what you're you're looking for and it, it gets back to that whole thinking thing. So, I mean, is it then a matter of, of tracking them and finding them in their beds or what's, you know, what's, what's the magic bullet here for killing a big mule deer? (laughs) <laughs> well, it all depends. Like right now I'm talking about the rut. It all depends on, on the time of year. So, you know, staying on that, that, that theme is I think why the calendar matters is because right around October 20th, uh, things start to change and, um, there you start get, getting your first does in estrus. And this will have a little bit to do with the, with the, with the moon phase and, you know, when the full moon falls in October and things like that, which I don't have all the, all the secrets to, but I know that, yeah, the research that's been done on whitetails that that's that's key is when that full moon falls in October. But let's just say that the rut, you know, the reason I picked October 20th, it's the earliest I've observed it starting. And you see these does first start to cycle into estrus, and that's what puts the bucks on 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 the on the move. And so what I see at that time of year is large expanses of buck country with no bucks in it. And they, they, it's because they are now looking for does. They are moving to where the does are. And it's not just a function of finding the does and like, oh, there's the does. So the big buck should be right here. No, it's understanding that he still feels very vulnerable around those does. Does are um, going to inhabit, you know, more open country. They're, they're not hunted as much in most places. I'm not saying they're not wary, but they're not as wary as a big buck. Typically, maybe that lead doe is, but you know, they're, they're, they're just easier to find. Well, a buck is going to feel, uh, vulnerable and, and being out there checking those does. And, 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 and so he's very careful about when he goes around them and it's almost always at night. I've seen this by their tracks on the ground and, you know, many guys have verified it with trail cameras and, um, night scopes and stuff like that, that they'll be around these does before legal shooting light. But as soon as legal shooting light, um, comes, you know, they're, they're retreating back into the cover. They're not very far from them. I believe, um, they know what that smell in the air is. You know, if this, we're talking sex here, people, you know, they know what that is. They're not, you know, I, I it, this is, gets back to that thinking thing. I get guys tell me, oh, they're not running right now. You know, they're back on these big peaks. You know, they're getting ready for the rut. Oh no, 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 no. It's Friday night at the bar. They know what's going on. They're, they're right here somewhere. And so you, you gotta, you gotta, be prepared to try to find a bunch of does at that time because, you know, there's not a lot of big bucks. And so, you you know, it's not that every group of does is going to have a big buck around them, but that's where I'm going to start. And then, um, and on my tracking jobs, then they tend to be very long. Like the, it seems like the bucks are going from group to group to group, uh, covering a lot of country. And so it's very hard to track them then, um, you know, because they can, you know, compared to like a month earlier, you know, I've had tracking jobs that are as short as 400 yards. You know, they're just not moving very much. Um, but, you know, you get into to the rut, you know, they they can move a, a mile in 20 minutes, you know, and, that, and, 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 and I don't care if you're Cam Haynes. I mean, if that's rough country, you can't cover the ground as fast. And so, um, so that's what I see happening then. And then as I get into... About November 10th is when I think the peak of the rut really starts to kick in. And, you know, that's, that's shown by the, by the studies that have been done on the, on the does when the fawns are born, you know, most of them are getting bred right around mid November. The bucks do get very, even the big bucks, they're, they're, they're going to drop their guard at that time, but you still got to be around the cover and, you know, you you just have more of a chance of catching them out at 10 30 in the morning and stuff like that. And, and there's exceptions to all of this. I mean, you'll, you'll see one in my book, a guy, you know, caught a big buck just last year when we had an early rut last year, October 22nd, right in the does at 11 AM. But that that's an anomaly. That's a unicorn. You know, we can't count on that. I typically don't see that till, you know, 8th, 9th, 10th of November. And so I don't want to say you can get a little sloppier than you, you can't, you still have to hunt, right. But you've got to, you've got to, um, 
better chance of them dropping their guard. And I see that continue clear up till about Thanksgiving. But then after that, as the number of does and estrus drops off, you know, a lot of them have been bred. Um, the buck activity drops off a little bit too, and they can get a little bit harder to find. And, and because these mule deer are migrational, most of them, not all of them, um, you're, you're, that's the other challenge is you're trying to keep track of them as they migrate, you know? And so, so where there was a bunch of does Thursday and now it's Sunday, it's like, man, we're down like 80% on does here. And, you know, the math is going to say, we're going to be down that much on bucks too. And so, you know, it's it just all these little things that are that are that are coming together. And I think what the challenge is, is it's hard to observe this with your eyes. You know, you have to, you know, because they're in the trees. You know, that's the white tail guys are the masters of that. You know, they're in the trees, too. They're up in the trees. You know, they know they know what's going on. We're mule deer hunters, you know, are typically not. You know, we're we're looking more at the open country. So I'm kind of going on and on. I don't know if I'm giving you your answer there, but the but that's that's really um you know, that time of year, I'm keying in on the does and I'm never getting very far from them is, is kind of my tactic then where earlier in the season, it's more about, you know, uh, just, just hunting the bucks in the rougher country where, you know, they tend to separate themselves from the does and, you know, got different challenges then, but you know, a lot of times are a little bit easier to find them. So as far as mule deer go, you know, with, again, I'm used to talking to elk, the bulls will go and they'll kind of gather cows to them with the muleys. It sounds like what you're saying is more the, the does will gather and the bucks will go to these different groups of does. They don't really kind of bring them along with them. No, they're not a herding animal like a bull. Um, you know, sometimes everything, there's an exception to everything. And yeah. that's why I want to be careful about, you know, I don't want to make these grand statements that this is how <laughs> it always is, but, but, you know, for the most part, big bucks, four years old and older, and especially the old grumpy ones, you know, we're talking seven, eight, nine years old. I don't think they want to be in with that big herd of does myself. It's This is just simply my opinion. They, they have to be to get one. You know, they may be around them, um, but if you watch them closely, they're usually keying in on, on, on the one that's in estrus. They're trying to, trying to peel her away from that herd. And I think w- what they want, they're, they're, if they could choose... They want to get her alone. They want to get her away from all those other deer because they're out in the open. They're more vulnerable. You know, they're just, he's not stupid. He still knows that that's trouble being out where everybody can see me. And he wants to get her back in the cover and that's where he wants to breed. And um, I think he'll hold on to her for a day or two. To, until she gets to, to, you know, full estrus, whatever you call it. I don't know if that's even a scientific term, but ready to breed. Um, and, and then he, then he breeds her and then he's, then he's on, he's on to the next one. And I think that's, that's what he wants to do. And um, I think when you see a big buck with a bunch of does, I think he's, he's still not, he's not down with that. That's just what he has to do to get a doe. And, and, and if you given enough time and, and, the situation you're going to see him try to get her alone is what he's going to try to do. And if you ever get lucky enough to really observe that when he's got her alone, she's very distracted too. I mean, she, she knows that they're perpetuating the species and she, she yields to that for that brief amount of time, you know, and um, where, when she's not quite in estrus, you know, she's playing hard to get, you know, she's making him chase her all over the place, which makes him vulnerable too. I don't think he likes running, you know, wide open across the sagebrush. You know, that's, that's, that's wasting energy. It's making himself vulnerable, tired. You know, I think, I think he really just wants to break, break away and, and get her alone. And, and then, so that's, that's what they're trying to do. I think that's their, their gold standard. I mean, you know, I really, I really can't blame him. You know, the older I get myself, the less I want to spend Friday nights at the bar. So <laughs> <laughs> there you I mean, go, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. I started laughing. I'm choking. Uh, that's all right well hey I'll, I'll i'll fill in the gap there we're with <laughs> elk you know uh, i'm an outfitter too dude I, I i'm an outfitter too and so i get plenty of elk experience um because uh, we operate on on private land i do semi-guided hunts for guys where i'm not 
I'm not hunting with them all the time, but I'm, you know, uh, orienting, orienting them with the properties, checking in with them each day, you know, stuff like that, giving them advice. And so, you know, I, I get to be around elk and what I've noticed back the whole elk herding thing is the elk are not the bulls or the big bulls are not as worried about getting a lone cow. They will control that whole herd, you know, and that they, they will circle that herd. They'll, they'll spend all their energy doing that. And I've seen that, you know, clear into late October, you know, and, and, and so that's kind of the difference that I see with them and mule deer. I'm not saying that makes bulls easier, you know, cause you got all those cows too. You got to try to get past and everything. Um, but uh, that makes it uh, makes them a little more visible, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so are there any other, you know, must learn techniques or anything, any other tips that are really unique uh, to somebody that's maybe, you know, they've they've got a few millies under their belt, you know, whether that's, you know, a, a spike here or there or, you know, just a couple of forkies, you know, younger age class kind of stuff. And they're really wanting to get their hands on at least one, you know, bigger, older age class mule deer. Are there any other, you know, tips or techniques or anything they should keep in mind uh, for this season? Yeah. And um, I'll give, give my, my first book a plug on that. The, the, the title of my first book is Hunting Big Mule Deer, subtitle how to take the best buck of your life. A subtitle is what's going to answer your question because that's where we, we, we separate the, the chaff from the wheat right there is that if you want to take the best buck of your life, you have got to focus on different hunting techniques and the nuances of, of mule deer hunting. And, um, and that's why in my book, in my articles, I always say, yeah, glassing is your number one technique. Definitely. I spent a lot of time glassing. It can't be your only technique, um, especially in hunted units. Now, if you have an excellent draw tag and there's only 20 people in a hundred square miles, okay, some of the stuff you can throw out the window. Um, um, but if you're hunting hunted bucks, it's going to get down to the tracking and the still hunting uh, more so or as much as the glassing. Now, that doesn't mean you're still not spotting and stalking. You, you know, that's kind of the essence of mule deer hunting. That's what you're doing. But where the disconnect is, is between the spot and the stock is where a lot of us fall apart. And I still experience this sometimes is because those big bucks go in the cover. And now what do I do? And, you know, the, the patient thing, the, the thing that, that, that sells articles is like, oh, I was, I sat there for five days. I, I did the, I was <laughs> as patient as a rock and that can work. I'm not, I'm not discounting that, but that can also backfire big time. And uh, I've learned this from Jason Carter. You got to kill them when you see them. You got to figure out how to kill them when you see them, you know, as, as quickly as you can and quickly, maybe four hours, but you know, because once one, you can't corner a big meal there, you know? So I use that term loosely, but once you got them cornered, you know, where they're at, you, you, you probably can't just wait for them to repeat their, their morning routine. They probably won't. You know, they'll do something different. They will hand you your butt on a plate. They will, <laughs> they will do something different and, and, and then they're gone and you got to refine them. And so, so figuring out how to kill them. And, and, and that's where all these other little sub techniques, tracking, still hunting, you know, all those things, ambush hunting, that's a huge one. It, it come into play. And, 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 and the, the thing about all those and where I, I get a little, oh, I just, I hate to sound like, and you, you were, you were saying it a minute ago, making fun of it. And you're right. You know, what's the silver bullet? <laughs> is, 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 there's not one. And that's what I want to make sure that, that guys understand is you can glass, still hunt, track, ambush hunt. You can do all of that stuff correctly for years and still not get a big buck. But you have to keep working those processes to get a big buck. You have to, those things will be in play when you get a big buck on purpose. Not talking about the guy that got lucky. Um, my, my luck is overrated. Luck is finicky. I, I, I want to, I want to do it on purpose, but you'll find when you do do it on purpose, that those things will have come together in some, some part of a, of a scenario that allowed you to do that. And, um, guys should just 
go to Amazon and read the reviews on my book. Um, because I'm writing my second book, my editor had me go in and read some of those and see if there's anything we could pull out, you know, put in the new book. And so I was reading through them just in the last couple of days. And, and it was interesting to see that, that this is getting right back to your question that, you know, you've taken a few bucks. What's the next step? Go read those reviews. You'll see some of those guys are saying, this is what it took to push me over the edge. And, and they'll mention, you know, a few things that they were doing or different or whatever. Um, and, and that was just so refreshing to me to see that because I'm like, yep, that's why I titled the book that way. How to take the best buck of your life. Yeah, we can get mule deer bucks. Yeah, we can fill the freezer. I'm all for that. But if, if you want to go four years old or older on purpose and you want to kill more than more than three in your life, you're going to have to be doing some things on purpose. So it's so refreshing to read that when I get that feedback from guys that, yep, yep, this, this, this took me, this took me over the, over the finish line, you know, where before I was just kind of hanging back with the pack. And, um, so I hope, hopefully I've answered that, but that's how I think about it. No, that's awesome. I will, uh, I will definitely be linking to your book and all the books you suggested on the show notes page. That'll be the wild slash two thirty nine for episode two thirty nine. You know, Robbie, I really appreciate you taking the time to hop on the podcast with me. I'm glad we were able to sync this up. If folks wanted to uh, find you, and and actually, I want to give you a chance to uh, to give a little promo for Rock Slide for your scouting service. We've already talked about the book. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll kick it off with a little promo for rock slide. I, you know, when I first, you know, I'm kind of the adult onset hunter. When I first got into hunting, I, you know, that was one of the first resources that was recommended to me was rock slide for the articles, for the, the message board, for the classifieds, especially it was a great place. I've, I think half of the gear I still use. I got, I originally got a uh, second hand from rock slide, uh, right. on the rock slide forums. Um, and to this day, I still claim I, I, my, my self-proclaimed title is having left the best review on, of any of your products on the, the website I've determined. All right. <laughs> um, it's uh, it was for the okayest, uh, okayest hunter shirt. And okay. I, I just left the longest, most ridiculous out there review of my life. And I think, I think somebody from your team reached out to me on, ended up reaching out to me on social and saying, we have to send you a hat for that. <laughs> yes, definitely do. So, so when you say you put it on there, did you put it in the, in like in a forum thread or was it in the feedback on the store? No, it's like the actual product review on the, um, on the t-shirt in in the store it's like an in actual, the store okay the so, store. so dude, yeah tanya runs the store so a lot of times i don't see that as soon as we hang up dude i'm gonna go look at that because <laughs> i i've seen those reviews in there and i, I want to check that out but man we we appreciate that and i i appreciate the rock slide plug for people that don't know what rock slide is it's it's spelled r-o-k slide rockslide.com started by uh basically david long Aaron Snyder and Ryan Avery, David Long and Aaron Snyder have moved on to other things now. Um, and uh, Ryan Avery is my uh, co-owner. Um, and, and, and I was actually just one of the writers on there and I've kind of moved up the ladder and uh, now I co-own the site. So it's a large uh, forum, public forum, um, all about hunting, all things hunting. And, um, and it also has a, 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 an online magazine portion of it too. That's our homepage. And if you go to rockslide.com, that's where you're going to land. That's where our, all our articles are posted. That's where my blog is. Um, we have contributing writers, um, from, from members that send us articles. I just published a member, um, uh, article uh, last week and one two weeks ago on bear hunting. Um, we have a, a, a staff of writers that also produce content that are on our staff. Tony Treach is one of them. I mentioned him earlier in the podcast. And um, uh, so producing content for the magazine, but the forum is really where all the traffic is. Like that's what you mentioned right there. That's where you've learned a lot about gear. It's got, it's got a gear bent to it. Um, uh, you know, that's a lot, a lot of things that we're talking about, but you know, every, all things hunting. And we try to run a clean forum. You know, we try to make sure there's not a bunch of trolls on there, do our best on that. But we have a lot of great members that help us out with that, too. So it's got a pretty good feel for it as well. And um, uh, and Sam, do you remember your screen name? It was uh, it was back. So I rebranded the podcast a few years ago, but uh, I used to uh, I think I may still be living country in the city on uh, on gotcha. the rock slide forums somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, for um, those of you that don't join a forum, dude, we all we all have code names. 
you know, <laughs> so, you know, it might, <laughs> might be, you know, stalker Joe at five, nine, nine, you know, just this funny stuff. So that's why I always ask what people's screen names are. So I know who they are, and, you know, because I I'm an owner on the site. I'm easy to find. Mine's Robbie Denning. And, um, uh, but, but Sam, make sure you say hi when you're on there. And, um, uh, um, you know, pe- people have to be a sponsor to be able to post their podcast on there, but dude, we'll happily post this one on there for you. So make sure you let me know, um, uh, um, when, when it's ready and let's, let's get you a post up guys and go on there, listen to this podcast, subscribe to your podcast. And, um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great way to connect with people, but, but dude, according to Google, there's three or 4 million people that come to rock slide a year. So it, it, it's a huge crowd. It's a big, big slice of, of, of the North American hunting community and even beyond North America. And we got, we got a lot of, um, a lot of UK guys, Australia, you know, all the English speaking hunting countries are on there as well and everything. So it, it's a great place to be. And I, I appreciate you letting me talk about it. You know, it's how I make basically half my income and I'm, uh, and I love it. It's, we just turned 10 years old in February and it, it's been a blessing. I mean, I'm just, just really thankful to be, uh, to be part of it. Yeah, no, I I mean, I, I can't say enough about it. I found it to be an incredible resource. And, you know, uh, like I said, I still still use quite a bit of gear that I've uh, that I got from uh, from someone on Rock Slide, whether it was new or secondhand or I've got packs and optics and tripods. And I think I, I think I got my my teepee tent that I still use uh, off of Rock oh, Slide, yeah. my stove. <laughs> um <laughs> I think short of my camo and my boots, there's probably a little bit of everything I've gotten off a rock slide. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because, you know, we have our classified section. I think we have three. I think we have just general gear and we have an optics classified section. And I think there's a firearms one. I don't run that portion of the site. So I'm a little rusty on That's what Ryan does. And dude, our classifieds is just going crazy crazy it's one of our biggest sub forums mm-hmm. and but it's it, it, it it's because you can save so much money on there and, and you just you just laid it out i mean you bought entire system for hunting a western hunting system dude i'll bet you saved thousands of dollars going oh, that route at least a thousand easily i mean i'd saved at least four to five hundred dollars on the tent i purchased there you go. Um, and that's what I mean. And dude, so and a lot of this gear that's on there, I mean, it's lightly used, you know, guys buy it. Oh, it's not the tan I wanted, whatever. And because it's a pretty tight community, you know, you can't just get on there and bull crap people, you know, some of them will call you out now yeah. that, because we brought up, brought it up. I do want to let people know if you do use the classifieds, you can get ripped off and we have rules on there. You have to have at least 10 posts to, to be on there. You have to be part of the community. You know, we're watching it all the time. So you can't just get on there right now and buy some boots. You know, you gotta, you gotta prove that you're part of the community and everything, but that's just to protect people. And mm-hmm. it's, it's reduced, it's reduced the spam and it's reduced the ripoffs. Um, but also um, um, with PayPal and Venmo, they have, different levels that you can pay don't go the cheap route go the route where you pay a little bit more but your um uh purchase is insured yeah protected however they call that i I don't use those systems so i don't know but but dude the vast majority we we, of people we see get ripped on off on those go with the cheaper option i think on paypal it's called friends and family i think yeah and um, and people try to use that you know (laughs) i saved 15 bucks yeah, dude. And you just lost 400, you know, because, because that was actually a, a that was actually a, a guy in a, um, oh, I can't remember where all our, our ripoffs are going Russia or something like that. Probably knowing those guys. So, so, you know, protect yourself when you're on there, but it is, it is a great way to, to buy and sell gear. It really is. All right. So if folks wanted to follow along with you, where can they find you online? rockslide.com on the forums you'll see me on there um probably the easiest way i'm on instagram i try to post on there i'm, I'm not a heavy instagram poster but you you, you can see me on there I, I still have um the the ancient old facebook um <laughs> uh, everything's under robbie denning r-o-b-b-y denning and um uh, i i'm on there but we'd love love to see people over on rock slide too Awesome. Well, again, I'll make sure to link to all of that on the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Robbie, thank you so much for taking the time to hop on with me today. Dude, you're welcome. It was great. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com to get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. There's a ton to check out. Uh, We'll have links to all of those books where you can find them on Amazon or other websites. 
also a link to Robbie's book, to Rock Slide, all of those great websites. A big thank you to Robbie again for hopping on. I appreciate him taking time out. And uh, there's some really great mule deer information in there. So y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to the Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 